Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We are physicians and professors at Yale University. We're trying to get closer to the truth about health and healthcare. This week, we'll be both speaking with Dr. James Hamblin. But first, we'd like to check in on current health news. Harlan, what's, what's uh, got your attention? Well, you know, in the world of the pandemic, there still remains a lot of stuff going on, uh, not to mention that we got a second pandemic now going on, which, is, as you know, the World Health Organization took this amazing step over the weekend to declare monkeypox a public health emergency of international concern, a designation that is only now currently describing two other diseases, COVID-19. And you know what the other one is? I, I did read it. Now I don't even remember. It was a polio, 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 polio. Right. And, yep. and which is, of course, of also great interest because there's now been a case of polio reported. I mean, you know, how much uh, more can we take a, as a society? But the, the issue about the the WHO's declaration about monkeypox, again, only COVID and polio. So now monkeypox joins it as a public health emergency of international concern. And, you know, something like, I don't know, 75 countries have reported almost uh, 20,000 cases. And we know that there, you know, only probably a, a minority of the actual cases are being reported. People are now going to look at wastewater. And uh, and then there's a lot of vague guidance. And uh, I mean, for example, like you can get this from touching. And so what's that mean? I think this is just freaking people out. So I know in the outro, you're going to be sharing a lot more of your views about this. But I think that uh, all I'm telling people is just take a deep breath, first of all. Like, information's still coming in. We may have, you know, missed an opportunity to move more quickly. But, and I know you're going to get into this. But but I worry that this just adds to the anxiety in the ecosystem. And also people just turn off after a while because unless there's clear guidance, you know, it's hard to follow. So that that's one thing. And I know, like I said, you're going to follow up more. A another thing that's been coming out that, that people are talking about is uh, is Evashield. And, and, you know, this is this a combination, a monoclonal antibody. And, and I thought I would just explain it to people because there's a lot of messaging that's coming out that's saying that it's being underused. And people may be wondering, well, what, what, what's all this about? What What is this exactly? So, look, just to get really basic, SARS-CoV-2, as m most people know by now, but uses a spike protein. The spike, you know, we talk about the spike because the, the vaccine creates antibodies to the spike. It creates a spike to attach itself to human and enter human cells, which is how it causes the infection. The monoclonal antibodies bind to this spike protein, and they prevent the virus from entering and infecting human cells. It's sort of like this is the roadway it takes. This is the sort of uh, lock and key, and we block it. So it, it can't really connect with the human cells and enter it. And by the way, that, that is what happens with the vaccine, too. The vaccine creates and our own antibodies. This Evashield is a combination of antibodies that are being manufactured. And what we can do is, is to deliver this combination medication to help prevent the infection. Now, here's a key. This combination is not a treatment for COVID-19. And it shouldn't be given to patients who are already infected. It's really about trying to prevent the infection itself. And the, it's targeted toward a certain group of people. Now, this was given emergency use authorization in December 2021 by the FDA. And, and they said that eligible patients could include adults and those people 12 and older who are at least 88 pounds and are moderately to severely immunocompromised due to medical condition or immunosuppressive medications. And may have an inadequate immune response. These are people who can't mount a defense. And so th this is who it should be given for. So when you're reading to say, here's an underutilized medication, it is it is for a specific slice of the population. It's not for everybody. And it is shown to be uh, pretty effective. It can substantially decrease the risk of developing symptomatic COVID-19 for actually up to six months after administration. So it, it's pretty good like that. There are some potential side effects, of course, just like everything, allergic reactions, where they inject it, it, it can cause local uh, swelling or bruising, all the kind of usual stuff. But, but the main thing is that these are usually pretty effective and people tolerate them well, but it's only for a certain population. So I just wanted to introduce for people listening this issue because they may have heard, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of chatter about this being underutilized. So 
No, I was just going to say that I, I think um, the most common vaccinated person I saw presenting with severe COVID uh, during the Omicron surge was uh, the patient with a transplant, with a renal transplant or sometimes a liver transplant. And, you know, Evyshield is exactly for that patient, the patient who the vaccine is never going to work well enough because they're on immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, so I couldn't agree more. And, and it's nice to see that the evidence continues to confirm that it works. So and we want to just amplify that message for people to know who, who are fitting in that group. Thanks, Howie. So I'm eager to hear uh, James. Let's let's get going. I'm, uh, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. James Hamlin. Uh, Dr. Hamlin is a preventive medicine physician and lecturer in health policy at the Yale School of Public Health. He's the author of If Our Bodies Could Talk and Clean, the latter of which was named an editor's pick by the New York Times Book Review and listed among the 21 best books of 2020 by Vanity Fair. James previously served as a staff writer and senior editor at The Atlantic, where he also had a humorous, thoughtful, and wildly popular video series with the same title as his book, If Our Bodies Could Talk. His work has been featured in The New York Times, Politico, NPR, The Guardian, and more. He has appeared on CNN, NBC, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and more than that. He earned his bachelor's at Wake Forest and attended medical school at Indiana University, which is when I first came to know him. He then trained at UCLA, uh, partially in radiology, and then completed the residency in general preventive medicine and public health at Yale, where he earned an MPH from our school. And this is where we met yet again. On February 24th, he penned a piece for The Atlantic entitled, You're Likely to Get the Coronavirus. Early on in the pandemic, this was occasionally mocked as being alarmist. And as with so much of his work, it turned out to be spot on and prescient. So first of all, James, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I want to just start off by asking, you are, if anything, one of the most expert generalists in the world on so many topics. You've written about topics like COVID where it would, I'd be hard pressed to find anyone who knows more about COVID than you do, but you know it as a generalist. You're not a vaccinologist. You're not a virologist. You know more about the skin biome than anybody I certainly know. And yet this is not your area of scholarly um, expertise. What draws you to a particular topic within healthcare or health? And, and draws you in to want to learn so much about it? Uh, that's a great question. And, and thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I'm a big fan of both of you and a long time listener, first time caller. Um, Indeed. You know, what I love about love that, journalism. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about journalism is that you get to follow uh, what you're interested in and you get to keep keep learning and challenging yourself and then you have to kind of quickly learn as much as you can digest it and then regurgitate it in a way that is ideally uh entertaining and informative uh to people so i it's a mix of what is interesting to me and what i think is important for people to know and would be of interest to them and then also just because i've been doing this for 10 years kind of like stuff that is new to me i like to try to not I don't want to just be repeating myself. So yeah, I don't have an, an, any area of expertise and I lean away from trying to go too far down a hole. I've done a lot of reporting, say on food and nutrition, the food system. Um, but it, as you go further, you go deeper, you kind of, you end up speaking only to people who are already expert <laughs> in it. So if you want to continue to speak to a general interest audience, then you have to kind of keep pushing yourself into new areas so you don't get too niche and you're talking about just one aspect of one bill or one policy proposal that's really not of interest to anyone who who isn't already actively following the subject. So James, it's great to have you on. And uh, boy, we don't often have someone who says I'm not an expert at anything on, but also someone has accomplished who is <laughs> That's great humility. Uh, look, by the way, the Indiana University connection, I spent a uh, summer in high school in Bloomington. That, it, let's just talk about that for a second. Isn't that a great place? Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. I, it's <laughs> second only to New Haven, Connecticut. I <laughs> <laughs> there, that is the right answer. That's the right answer. So so I, I, I've i read your stuff and it's, it is really enlightening. And let's just talk about Clean, you know, a, a book that you published uh, just before the pandemic, 
And I just wanted to read a couple things from it to kind of go through a few things for for listeners. So it, it starts off by saying, five years ago, I stopped <laughs> showering. At least by most modern definitions of the word, I still get my hair wet occasionally, but I quit shampooing or conditioning or using soap except on my hands. I also gave up other personal care products, exfoliants and moisturizers and deodorants that I had always associated with being clean. And then, then you said, well, you know, what's the ROI on, on giving all this thing? <laughs> Maybe besides uh, repelling some people that you don't want to have close to you. But, but you say, <laughs> if you spend 30 minutes per day showering and applying products over the course of a long life, let's just say 100 years for the purpose of optimism and ease of math, you'll spend 18,250 hours washing. At that rate, not showering frees up more than two years of your life. And, and you go on, uh, I think, to make the case about about a lot of these products and a lot of our habits. You, you know, one thing that occurred to me reading your book, and I really recommend it, it's a, it's a fun book, it's an enlightening book, it's got a lot of facts that, that many people may not be aware of. But one of the things that reminded me that there's so much in our lives that we take for granted as being part of the human condition, how we sleep, how we eat, and in this case of this book, how we clean ourselves. Because, you know, just for example, as you know, take breakfast, for example. I mean, the how embedded orange juice is or what Kellogg's did to making us think about, you know, what sugary treats ought to be part of our, our menu in the morning. But you, you kind of go into this whole thing about saying, you know, the way we're acting now isn't the way humans have always acted. And it's not clear that it's a positive evolution. And in large cases, it's a response to industry I'll say it like this, sort of manipulating our taste. So I, I don't know, but give it give a little background. Like how did you get into this? What it, what interested you in? And are you still not taking a shower? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start with the last one. I'm a minimalist in that way, and I'm not prescriptive about it for other people, but the whole journey of investigating this book and learning about the skin microbiome and the history of our beliefs. Uh, about hygiene and cleanliness it really changed my own habits to such that I only do things that I really find to be enjoyable or truly necessary in some medical sense, like brushing your teeth to prevent, you know, cavities um, and tooth decay. So uh, yeah, I, 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 and this is something uh, Harlan that you talk about on this podcast often that our environments, that our day-to-day -day habits really form the foundations of our health. And a lot of it is shaped by our ecosystems, by our societies, by policies. Um, but there's some degree to which that is affected by our individual decisions and our habits and our beliefs and things that are with our, within uh, the realm of, you know, things that we could voluntarily change. And so that's, you know, whether it's sleep, uh, relationships, uh, physical activity, uh, what we eat, um, how we clean ourselves, what we apply to ourselves, what we put on in, in our bodies. All of that tends to be very interesting to me because that's the sort of thing that, you know, you're doing it every single day for years and years and years. And that is probably having overall a cumulative effect. And even if at an individual, you know, on a single day, it doesn't especially seem like it would matter. So those habits and, and thinking about uh, building lifelong, sustainable, healthy systems uh, habits, lifestyles, well, that's well, all uh, of interest to me. Yeah. One thing I want to just jump in on here, though, and, and then I'll yield to Howie again. Yeah. But so in the course of a public health pandemic, we're trying desperately to modify people's behaviors. We're trying to get them to do very simple things that might slow the spread or, or mitigate the transmission of the virus and to improve outcomes. And even the most basic things, having a highly effective vaccines, you know, we're having trouble getting the penetration. Meanwhile, some of these things that uh, have percolated throughout the entire society uh, seemingly in, in rapid progression to become embedded in our behaviors, like, you know, the use of, of, of soap and shampoo and the way in which we work. I mean, people may find this crazy, but it's just, as you described, this isn't something that was always part of it. And yet industry found a way to make it so that we can't live without it. But you talk, I'm going to just pivot now to the moment, which is, you talk about, for example, uh, how soap, which was already starting to sell well, began to really take hold after the 1918 influenza pandemic. How are these companies so successful at molding these health behaviors and public health officials are, are unable to do so? And then I have a second part of it, which is what do you think is going to be the change in behavior that emerges out of this pandemic that's going to be seized on by 
I, you know, some of the same forces? Well, uh, yeah, those are huge questions. I mean, I think fundamentally, um, there have been more than 100 years of intense, competitive, high dollar marketing um, that has gone into creating our beliefs about hygiene. And, um, and with that is a self perpetuating cycle by which people form beliefs about themselves about uh, others and socially enforce these things where we'll say that people are gross or disgusting if they don't say wash their hair um, or if they smell, you know, like a human bot. Like if you can detect any smell on a person other than like lavender, then they are gross or disgusting. And it's one of those, it's one of the few areas where even, you know, socially progressive people will still be very openly judgmental. You know, maybe, you know, in a former generation, People might have been that way about, uh, you know, obesity or uh, different uh, sexual orientations that were at less than mainstream. And as society has progressed and become people have become much more open minded, accepting. And yet those same people will just kind of be like, oh, you don't use this. You don't you didn't shower. You don't use deodorant. That You're gross. You're disgusting. Like um, so it's kind of one of the, the final barriers there that I think it's really only a, a matter of people not examining their beliefs and where they come from and still associating those products with uh, disease, with contagion, with thinking that, uh, but um, partially because of how they're marketed and how they're sold. If you go into Walgreens or CVS, you see two aisles of like deodorants and shampoos, which are doing zero to prevent any disease, prevent or treat any disease, but they're right there next to all the, you know, medications that help you take care of your cold or uh, prevent, uh, you know, right next to the counter where you're getting your prescription. So it's all bundled in. And I think a lot of people just haven't thought about what, what is the line between cosmetic and medical or, or health product. And that's sort of what I'm interrogating in, in the book. So I, I, I first want to draw people's attention also to the fact that you have a newsletter that you update on a irregular basis, but regularly regular. regular. <laughs> Um, and it, it's called The Body, and, and the, uh, the address is body.bulletin.com, but we'll, we'll make sure that's in the notes for the podcast. But I'm struck by, like, just how much time you will put into a single newsletter. And, and I'm not referring to the one about peanut butter s'mores, which I think is also very important that we may get to. But most of the others are very lengthy investigations of specific topics. And just to give people an idea of like just how varied they can be, you have many on COVID, obviously, because that's been a hot topic. But you've also talked about uh, the biofilms on your teeth. Uh, you know, the use of Juul, an electronic cigarette, and how can that be banned when cigarettes are not. Uh, you also talk about um, the health effects of lawns uh, and so on. How do you, you're, so you're writing these long form pieces, uh, which by the way, you get a lot of uh, comments from people and you're able to get feedback on both Twitter and Facebook on them. How do you pick a topic? Like what strikes you? You've also written about abortion, by the way. You've done a great job on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, yeah, that has been a kind of casual project. I started off kind of blogging like a lot of people about a decade ago. And during especially the pandemic, I felt like it was, I mean, of necessity, very high stakes and very serious. And I wanted a platform where I could be a little more casual. Again, um, I, you know, I, I don't always want to be like preaching <laughs> to people. Sometimes I just want to be working things out on the page, which you used to be able to do on the internet a little bit more. My platform grew and I'm fortunate for that, but I also d didn't get to be like, I kind of had to have a fully formed idea before I opened my mouth. And I wanted to go back to working things out on the page and having a dialogue with readers. And that, so that's what, that's what the body is. Something will pop into my head and I can, uh, quickly write it. Body.bulletin.com. That's great. James, did you come up with the title of the article, You're Likely to Get the Coronavirus? Or is that something an editor came up with? Uh, you're Likely to Get the Coronavirus? Yeah, that was my idea for a headline on the morning that it published. I've been working on this story for a couple, for like a week before, and that was in February. And then in the morning, uh, we were running, they'll always run the headlines by me and ask if I have any ideas or feedback on it, make sure I'm okay with it. And I was like, you know, actually, I think we could probably say at this point, you're going to get it. And that was, that was like radical. And we, 
watched right away for responses to it to see if people were freaking out or you know if there were people who were like serious people taking issue with it and they weren't so we stuck yeah. with that so so howie i know we're coming down t to the end and i just have a couple quick things i want to ask james based on the stuff that i've read that he's written and one is uh you know <laughs> Between the pandemic and now we've got monkeypox, you know, which we're all talking about. And by the way, I mean, the guidance on monkeypox is so, so vague, you know, it's sort of like, well, you can get it from people touching you. So like, you know, if you like, what's that supposed to mean? And you, you, you wrote this piece in the book in clean that I thought was really important, which is that the health benefits of touch itself, platonic touch devoid of any sort of relationship is well documented. And then you talked about your interviewing one of the pioneers in the field, Tiffany Field, a developmental psychologist uh, who founded this Touch Research Institute at the University of Miami. And again, you you wrote this book before the pandemic, but I just wonder if you have any reflections now on, you know, how we need to incorporate the, the whole spectrum of potential unintended adverse consequences of going after one thing. So if we say we're going to minimize spread of X, and by the way, th which would be a, a, a a good thing to do but like what else do we lose lots of people focused on the economic fallout from from uh harsh constraints on society in order to slow the curve and by the way when the hospitals are overflowing it there's no question there was a need to do things but as we start looking at this do you think now that or maybe you always have that there's a need for us to incorporate the full spectrum of, of impacts of all of our public health initiatives, because even something simple as touching starts as people are sequestered and isolated. You know, we, we take that away from people. Yeah, no, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because as you know, and I know how he knows that's always been part of the public health calculus. And if I, if I recall correctly from that piece I wrote back in February at the end of it was February, 2020, the end of it was, we're going to have to figure out how to open up and balance prevention of transmission with living with this that was the point of it and there was this sort of false narrative among some political opportunists i think who were saying oh the public health people just want you to shelter in place and lock down and don't care about anything else and haven't considered the effects of closing schools but i don't know anyone who's you know th that that was just not a thing and so that's the way i know that i and you and howie and everyone else has been thinking about this as you know, what's the overall balance for the healthiest? Yeah, yeah. Um, we can't ask people to give up their whole lives, world. but yeah, it's the balance. No, and yeah, and I don't know anyone who who has, honestly. So yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I think there are a lot of great debates to have over about how to strike that balance. But like the idea that we need that balance is, I don't think, up for debate. I mean, it's, it's and, frustrating and I have, to hear people. Well, and I have one about, more just, yeah. just from the book that I wanted to say that I thought was interesting that people might find. Uh, just a useful fact. And one of the things that you wrote was that it wasn't until 2013 that the FDA told producers of antibacterial soaps that they needed to substantiate claims that antimicrobial cleaners have any benefit at all. And I think here, by the way, you're just talking about like the effect on bacteria, not even effect on actually people's lives and health, but like whether or not people who are making these claims. And that, that's only 2013. And before that, people could be making a lot of different claims on these soaps that that weren't substantiated were you surprised to find that out or and what and what, what do you think about it? <laughs> yeah i will never be surprised to learn that the fda has not really regulated something in the supplement or personal care space so that and that extends to to vitamins supplements dietary supplements as well you can basically and i do in the book make my own skincare product and create my own line and all you have to do is register an address with them and be like I'm, I'm i'm selling this just so you know and then you can make all these really interesting you know claims innuendo wise as long as you're not saying this cures skin cancer or this prevents cardiovascular disease you can say oh it uh you know is protective to the uh, dermal layers or it is uh, uh it promotes <laughs> cardiac Promotes cardiac wellness, and anyone who's you know worried about cardiac disease is gonna is gonna read between the lines there. <laughs> so I, but I think that people don't realize that space is kind of the wild west, and pretty much anything can be in there. So we, so are you selling your stuff? I mean, it's sort of the anti soap. So your preparation, it could go wild. It's like yeah, anti. You should do it now, James. Uh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, 
I am doing really well on the supplement space right now. <laughs> no, I couldn't actually. Some people, I, I created the site and I charged $200 for a two ounce bottle and some people really actually did want to get it and I couldn't bring myself to actually <laughs> go through with, with selling it. But there are, there are people out there selling creams and serums. By the way, the more expensive products. sometimes, the more customers you get. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think that be, because of this uh, lack of, information for consumers we don't have a lot to go on so yeah, if it's more expensive yeah. it that's one of the few cues of oh it must be a better product well, um, I, yeah. I will I, I will say this though for a man who perpetually looks like he's 20 years old uh i don't think you need much much more than to just show your no, picture no this is evi this is evidence it's working <laughs> howie it's it's working i know that's what i'm saying yeah, that's what i'm saying i think that's all the marketing because he he's not he's not scraping off the skin layers every day with all the water <laughs> yeah. well yeah, so part of it. so anyway james i want to just thank you so much for spending the time with us it's been really enlightening and and you're such a great communicator i mean i think it really both your thinking and then your ability to express it to the public it, it's a it's a, such a gift and and really uh, appreciate you coming on with us and appreciate all the work that you're doing. Oh, yeah. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. And thank you for everything you do for Yale University as well. You've been an amazing teacher of our students, a mentor, an advisor, and, and we appreciate it very much. Well, thank you for the podcast. I will continue listening to it uh, every Thursday. Uh, <laughs> We're going to have you come back. We're going to have you come back soon enough. All right. How okay. he's going to re how he's going to replace me with you soon? So just so you know. <laughs> so that was great, Howie. Let's. Uh, I, I think it's a good time for us to pivot to the final section. And um, so, what, what's been on your mind uh, this week? Yeah. So as you mentioned earlier, the monkeypox outbreak honestly has been a fiasco. Um, and while I mostly kept my opinions to myself, I also admit to being misled and frankly wrong two months ago. When this first started to be a concern, I was confident that we would see a lot more cases, but equally confident that we, at least in the United States, could and would contain this as opposed to merely mitigating the outbreak. After all, we had vaccines, therapeutics, testing, and knowledge from decades of global experience with what we have called monkeypox to this moment. When the early outbreaks were identified as being centered in predominantly gay groups of individuals, it was not clear that this was being predominantly spread through sexual contact. Uh, and in fact, it was almost misleading what people were saying. It was mostly that they were talking about social contact. And the thinking was that this was much like some earlier outbreaks of COVID that occurred in settings such as a Jewish synagogue, gay bars, or church choirs. The mechanism was likely person-to-person -person contact. It is becoming increasingly clear that there is non-sexual person-to-person transmission, but it is vastly outweighed by sexual transmission. 98% of cases so far in the United States involve men who have sex with men, and 95% of cases are traced to sexual transmission itself. We may not have understood this early on, but we need to get this message out now and take the appropriate actions to mitigate, even if we can no longer completely contain it. And that involves educating communities, providing testing as needed, and vaccinating both before as well as after exposure in order to minimize harm. As you sort of alluded to earlier, like people are still talking a lot about how do you get this and concern that if you're near someone with it, you might get it from them. You know, I have little doubt, quite frankly, that people will soon express fear about being around gay men, much as they did in the 1980s and 1990s with HIV AIDS. This will cause yet more harm than is necessary. But if we can do our best right now, we can mitigate that harm. We can reduce that harm. Our public health authorities have a lot of work to do and a lot of mistakes have already been made, but it is never too late to start taking this as seriously as it requires. Yeah, I'm really glad you said all these things. Look, the, as we said at the top of the podcast, the WHO making this designation is not a trivial thing. I mean, only two other conditions have it. And I think this issue around gay men, you know, there, there's also probably reporting bias. You know, people... Once the word gets out, people are going to get, get, be seen. And then that also leads, that stigmatization also leads other people not to be seen. It's like 
It's way too early, and, and, and there is potential great harm in making it seem like, you know, there's one community that's, that is spreading it, that's affected, that stigmatization is awful. So I'm really glad you brought this up, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. And, and by the way, it will spread. I have no doubt that it will spread beyond the gay community. How much, how wide, how bad, I don't know, but it will spread. And the stigma is going to be that somehow gay people brought it in and gay people gave this to me. I mean, this is not the case. This is an infectious disease. Given that there are only a, a, like a million and a half vaccines and they're not spreading, people probably won't take them anyway. Should James write a piece that says everybody's going to get monkeypox? <laughs> uh, look, I think, um, uh, you know, I didn't want to ask him during our segment, but I do think that's top of mind right now. I'm looking forward. He covers these things so well that I have yeah. no doubt that he's going to cover this well in yeah. weeks ahead. Yeah. Well, anyway, I hope the I, I can say at least that I know the administration is focused on this now and we've lost some time. But let's see. Let's see what unfolds. But again, I keep telling people, don't freak out. Don't freak out. You know, that's right. Just, that's yeah. right. OK. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So how did we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. That's H-M-K-Y-A-L. And I'm at the Howie. That's at T-H-E-H-O-W-I-E. You can also email us at health.veritas at yale.edu. Aside from Twitter and our podcast, I'm fortunate to be the faculty director of the healthcare track and founder of the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management. Feel free to reach out via email for more information on our innovative programs, or you can check our website, som.yale.edu slash EMBA. Health and Veritas is produced with the Yale School of Management. Thanks to our researcher, Jenny Tan, and to our producer, Miranda Schaefer. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks very much, Harlan. Talk to you soon.